Today we'll be taking a look at the third and final starter Squirtle in a Pokemon Red Solo Challenge. Check out the description if you want some more elaboration on the rules, but the basics are that I can only use Squirtle in battle, I can't use items in battle, and the TMs for Double Team and Toxic are banned. The goal here is to do multiple playthroughs and refine, optimize Squirtle to get the fastest time that I possibly can, and then we're going to rank it, we're going to stack it up against the other Kanto Pokemon, but grab yourself a Sodi Pop and let's just dive into it. Before I get into any details, let's uh, call out this tutorial battle. Squirtle just has tackle. Bulbasaur has growl, so this one always ends up feeling like a bad wet noodle fight where there are no winners, but thankfully Squirtle does outgrow this phase pretty quick. This video is kind of like a pseudo finale of the rankings for the starters. I did Bulbasaur recently and Charmander can be found in the live section of the channel. I'll try to put both in the description if I remember. Right now Charmander's fire typing and low stats did hold it back a good bit while Bulbasaur's access to sleep powder and swords dance, it lets it slip by virtually everything in the game and it gets a very high rank for a base stage Pokemon. Going into this one, my expectations was that Sleep Powder would just be too hard to overcome. And let's go over the information to see what we're working with and see how Squirtle contrasts with the other starters. As for the stats, there's not much to say. It's a base stage Pokemon. Everything's pretty low, nothing stands out. But like always, very low speed is gonna make things just that, that much more challenging. For level up moves, nothing here stands out. And Generation 1 being Generation 1, withdrawal is actually the best of the bunch here. And I would say it's perhaps the most important move of the playthrough. And if we kind of look at the TMs, we'll see why. The other two starters, they get access to Swords Dance while Squirtle has to go without it. And most of this TM list is going to play out like most water Pokemon. You get your choice of Ice Coverage, Stab Surf. Those are great. You're going to get Body Slam. It's useful as well. But what makes Squirtle kind of stick out over some other water types is access to Dig. So with that in mind, how much of a realistic shot do you guys think Squirtle has at beating Bulbasaur? I was really invested in this one. I really tried a good bit of times. So let's kind of go over the route and see what I thought gave this little Little turtle its best shot. Unlike Bulbasaur, I kind of got the footage right on the first time so there's no need to redo the run at the end of the video. With Bulbasaur, the key to unlocking a great time was early training, early candies, and I originally thought that this would be the play for Squirtle. Here you're going to see me just run past all the optional trainers, I'm going to battle the mandatory bug catcher, but here we do need to knock out a single wild encounter so that we can hit level 8 so we can get Bubble. I do bring up this actual speed run from time to time, and for good reason because it's by far the best way to learn how to play the game pretty well. But I would like to bring up that if you just went to Brock at level 7, you would level straight to 9. And the way the game is coded, it would essentially ignore learning Bubble at level 8. And it's something I feel like I have to mention if you're doing like a Squirtle run. Today I do need Bubble for some light years junior trainer grinding. But I'm not going to pull up the graphic today because it's going to be pretty quick. I just need to black out twice and when I win the battle normally I'm going to be level 12 and I'm already ready for Brock. Like always, the intro here is just a formality, but it is important to know that you could do this right away at level 8 and be just fine, but that's a bit short-sighted. And a slightly faster Brock split does not, in fact, equal a faster overall game time. Double weak to water, access to bubble, it makes this one a foregone conclusion. And let's just kind of get into that early game, get to the extra training part. So I'm just going to let the footage play out and let's just chill. Let's just take it down a little bit and talk about the next part of the game, get some thoughts out. Looking back at Bulbasaur, I do think that yellow version would be slightly faster just due to the rival two fight specifically. And I thought Squirtle would do better for similar reasons, but you might have noticed we're on red. I often talk about how I test both versions, but I got really far into finalizing the yellow routing for Squirtle before I made the switch over. That's going to be a story for later in the video. And I know this is a little bit in the future, but I want to talk about it now because I got a lot to say. Rival 2 in red version is not the best fight and this is the area of the game that you would prepare for that moment. I often personally fall into this bad habit of being lured in by consistency, specifically when it comes to speed and outspeeding your opponents. It just makes so much sense in my like little lizard brain just to train until you outspeed something like Pidgeotto and that was the first thing that I optimized originally. I was getting up to level 23 and it felt nice. It was really consistent, but my friends, I have to emphasize this point that easy doesn't equal fast. Sometimes you just gotta take off your bike helmet, throw it on the ground, grab the tailgate of your buddy's truck, tell him to get up to 60 miles an hour, and tell him to drive you towards the ramp because you're about to do a sick jump that's about to make little Jimmy jealous. You know what I'm saying? Take a risk. What's a broken leg or two? Do you even need a functional spine? For legal reasons, I do have to tell you that I'm just making a joke, but what made me happy with this run was cutting down parts of the early game, and it really saved 
saved me a lot of time. I'm kind of going off the rails. Let's kind of bring it back. Things aren't going to be in order in this footage, but getting 15 for water gun significantly speeds things up. And the question is, when do you want to get water gun? I tried routes where you would get it directly after Brock. And what I actually settled on was something that kind of kicks in about the end of the second trainer on Route 3. Looking towards Mount Moon, it's pretty light in here. I don't even fight the super nerd, and we, we always fight the super nerd. I feel like I kind of hurt his feelings when I was passing by him, but today we're just going to be doing two battles. I am going to get Mega Punch, I'm going to fight the Rocket Grunt down there, and I'm also going to get the Ether, which is it's really important coming up, remember that. And then it just it makes too much sense to fight the Hiker, so I squirt some water on it, and I'm on my way. And one quick side tangent is Squirtle is a portmanteau of Squirt and Turtle, and I think that's really clever, but my rotten adult brain just hates the word Squirt. The internet, it was a mistake. So this routing, it'll get me to level 19 at the end of Mount Moon. And after you beat the Golden Trainer in Misty's Gym, you're going to be level 20. And if you want this run to be any good at all, you're going to have to take on Misty before Nugget Bridge. This fight's gonna boil down to me just using Mega Punch until her Pokemon goes down. They'll just use Tackle, and it's straightforward, but it's really close at 20. I think maybe you could get lucky and do this at a lower level, but 20's pushing it. I would love to tell you how easy this is, but you're gonna see me in the footage here get by by the smallest of margins with only a single point of HP left, but this win is huge. And that's gonna be because we get access to Bubble Beam. It's a massive power spike specifically for water Pokemon. 65 base power with stab's gonna give you a 97 of effective power move, which is really good, but it is slightly less powerful than something like Bulbasaur got with its power spike with Razor Leaf. But keep in mind that we've done a lot less than Bulbasaur has up to this point. But let's look at rival number two. It's coming up next, and I think this is one of the worst battles in the run. Like I said earlier, level 23 is what you would need to outspeed and two-shot the Pidgeotto. It would make the fight very simple. With the slim down final Chad version of the route, we don't outspeed and it's gonna be a three-shot. So we have a lot of chances to see Sand Attack and we're not gonna see it here today. But the point is, the important thing was that I was willing to take some sand if that means saving five to seven minutes off the run. So we get to see like an ideal Pidgeotto scenario play out today and I can't really complain about it. The next two Pokemon are simple, but at the end you do have to worry about Vine Whip if you taking too much damage, but Mega Punch can two-shot it, and it's really just a matter of if you get really unlucky, so we take this one out. Now it's time for Nugget Bridge. Single highest cluster, you know the drill already. Remember I did pick up that Aether and Mount Moon earlier, and it's a key component into kind of just letting me turn off my brain, drool on myself, and just go into autopilot mode, spamming Bubble Beam the whole way. It really helps out to shave off a little bit of time. I do have to emphasize that cutting out a huge portion of battles up to this point over the previous iterations of the route is what saved me the most time at the end and it might surprise you that I didn't really get the 20 here necessarily for Misty or Rival 2 but we'll get into that detail soon enough. Outside of that Dig is available and I want to touch on it because it's such an important move for the run and it's just kind of it's unique coverage for a water move. It's pretty cool if you ask me. Down on the SSM we get access to Body Slam and I'm also going to grab the Rare Candy. Pretty standard stuff nothing out of the ordinary but it is an upgrade but let's go over the next rival fight and there's some talking points to go over. The battle itself is not going to be too interesting Interesting, but this is kind of how Rival 2 would have looked if you went in and overtrained earlier and wasted a lot of time. You just blast everything, you don't worry about much, and you get through this one very smooth like butter. But there's two important things that come up at the end. Level 28 is really important because we can learn withdraw with no swords dance. This is going to be our badge boosting conduit, and it's one, it's one of the most important pieces of the puzzle. And the second thing is just the art of carefully crafting the run to hit level 28 exactly at this moment. I just told you that the extra level is what necessarily for Misty or Rival number two, but they were so that we can hit level 28 right here because this is kind of where the real problems of the run lie. In red version, Surge has good AI, which means that his Rachi will just obliterate you at lower levels and you're never going to outspeed it. The easier Rival number two fight and the fact that Surge is lobotomized to have bad AI in yellow were the two main reasons that I wanted to do yellow version, but let's kind of just jump in, take a look and see why I stuck with red today. The first thing to talk about is Voltorb. It's not threatening on its own, but Sonic Boom means that you're gonna be in a lot more danger, but the strategy's simple. You can just kinda dig through the first Pokemon without too much thought. If you are level 28 at full health, you have slightly better than a coin flip to survive a Thunderbolt, and Dig is gonna one-shot no matter what. Here we see the classic Surge shenanigans. He goes for an X speed, and I just take the fight on the spot, so cool. I'll keep it real with you guys. I'll say the only reason that I ran red version today was because of Dig. It let me really simplify this fight into a 
a easy to get one shot. It pretty much has to go for Thunderbolt and even get a coin flip after that just to win. Now, if Squirtle didn't have access to Dig, you'd most likely be seeing yellow version today. But my friends, level 28, it wasn't just for Surge. Immediately after is the Wrapping Junior Trainer, you still need to take a risk here, but you will save a lot of time, and that involves just getting lucky for one turn. All you gotta do is just give me one turn game and we're good. You would prefer it go for Poison Powder or Miss, which I do get here, great, but one single withdrawal to give me that slight attack boost, it'll make Dig a guaranteed one shot on the Oddish, and then Body Slam can just take out the Bell Sprout. It was kind of like this double whammy in this run to kind of have Surge immediately followed by this fight, but it was kind of cool that you had to kind of route the run around these two points, which was, you know, pretty cool. But Squirtle, he handles it like a professional, and now that we got the hard parts over, I do finally want to go over some split data. So we know the drill by now by split data. We have changed it up. You can see clearly that bulb pace means bulb Bulbasaur, you get it. So we have to look at the first three splits here because just like the unique nature of Pokemon, we're gonna have a different mid game than the other Pokemon. So this is gonna be very important data. And you can see what I mean by cutting out a bunch of extra training early. And it's because it has given us a 15 minute lead by the time we get done with Lieutenant Surge. And you gotta remember that Bulbasaur invested early training, early candies to hit Razor Leaf, and then it started to take off from there. And if you're looking at this and saying, oh, Squirtle's just gonna run away with this one, not so fast, my friends. Remember, Bulbasaur invested early time to hit a power spike. Later, it's going to have Sleep Powder. It's going to have Sword Stance, which is a better setup move. And it's going to have to do less battles overall throughout the course of the game. But I just want to bring this up real quick. And I want you guys to see that Squirtle got a pretty comfortable lead over the other starters right now. 15 whole minutes to play with. Let's see how it kind of holds up. We'll look back at this around the Sabrina split. So now let's skip ahead to Celadon, and we're going to be taking on the Rocket Hideout first, pretty mandatory. I will be picking up a couple of PP ups for later, and there's there's no trouble here. I am going to pick up the high money items, and as far as Giovanni goes, we got Bubble Beam. Two of his Pokemon are double weak to it, and we finally get to see Kangaskhan. It can't be a menace like it usually is in some of the runs, especially on stream. We can keep this thing rolling straight into Pokemon Tower, and this is just kind of a tangent, but something that I found from doing so many runs is that Ice Beam just isn't needed and I would just rather hold off save a little time and just let bubble beam do the work here now if you route stuff in a specific way a fight like this is the only spot that it's gonna be useful in and if you need to rush a move for rival number four then the run probably isn't that good in the first place and you could probably just plan it a little bit better that's just my opinion on it outside of that we can touch on Gyarados body slam is an all right answer but we're never gonna have a direct answer for it and that's about all there is to say in this fight I do take a sand attack early and I actually get really low but we still make it through no worries here and dig is gonna be great for the ghastly later so we can just keep it cruising after that I am gonna hit up cycling road and I need to touch on the backers here now if you have a ground move like dig or you can just kind of deal with the poison types effectively this is a pretty great spot to grind levels on we've done it quite a few times on streams in the past and it just makes a lot of sense for Squirtle now I'm not gonna show every single one of these battles but you can see on the ones that I am showing that bubble beam or dig it can just kind of take care do what it needs to do I do have an elixir here that I'm gonna use just to overall manage the PP really well to get through this part efficiently but there are about seven really Really solid and efficient battles to take on and this is gonna be the one time in the game that Squirtle's really gonna take some time out of the run to get ahead in levels after that I finish up the Safari Zone it's really standard but access to surf is is huge 142 effective power with stab in neutral situations it's not to be taken lightly and that's gonna kind of transition us into our one Celadon buy today I'm gonna to be getting quite a few vitamins and that's just that's how it goes when you hold off shopping you have more money for vitamins I don't need to get mimic later and after selling the top floor TMs, I have just enough money to get three Carbos and four Calciums. The Carbos here, along with the three other Carbos in the run, will let us max out our speed stat experience. And the four Calciums actually helps with ranges in a few spots later. But let me go back to Ice Beam for a second. It's intuitive just to pick it up and use it. It's a pretty good move. But I just think that for my money, Blizzard is the best damaging move in the game. And I just don't see the benefit Ice Beam would give in this run at all. I just can't see it. Maybe it would save like two and a half seconds 
off of rival number four, but it takes way longer than two and a half seconds to get this thing, buddy. And you would have to sacrifice some vitamins. Now, I don't want to go off the rails here. Some of you might be scared of the 90% accuracy, but I think that you should just look deep inside yourself and just kind of welcome your new Blizzard Overlord and just embrace it. When that's done, we're heading down to Fuchsia and we're going to fight Koga and we're going to go to the gym. I'm just going to let the first juggler kind of play out in the background. It's not going to be the best fight. I do get low, but that's irrelevant. That's not the point. Just pay attention to what I'm saying up here. Let me snap. Does that sound good on the mic? I would like to focus on the big reason that we went with red version today and where I wasn't a huge fan of how yellow felt to play for this run. Koga and his Venonats and just the overall choices of where you can go at this point in the game and yellow version didn't feel intuitive. To get to the point that I'm going to be at in red version, you would have to insert so much extra grinding, you'd have to do silk first, you would likely have to use pretty much all of your rare candies and it felt really bad, it felt really slow to get through and over the course of the next few minutes, I think you're going to start to see how much more superior the red version routing actually was. We can just kind of jump into Koga now, and he's a bit of a gatekeeper. So being able to take him out now really just opened up the doors to have a pretty great time at the end of the run. The trick to this fight was setting up three withdrawals. We're going to get those boosts, and the big thing that can hold you back here is a smoke screen. Here I do get poisoned, but I do think that's better than the alternative, and you get two shot ranges on the hard things like the muck and the wheezing. And at the end of the fight, I try to be a little cheeky with it. I'm thinking I'll go down, so I try to soften up the wheezing with the surf to finish it off with a dig, and that's a good strategy but the problem is that it just barely survives the dig hits us with a big old boom and that self-destruct is going to force the first reset of the run now we get the battle we want next time but it's a fight like this where you can just see how the low base stats can really hold you back squirtle has a lot of things going for it but remember that almost all of the stats are in the 40 to 50 range and this is around the time the other starters would start to be grabbing sword stance and stack up those have that high damage their battles would start to be quicker but this one it was really important important to get through because of what it's going to open up for us. And that's going to be a brisk swim down to Cinnabar. Let's go. We needed a little break, so we just dip our toes in the water a bit. And the only thing to really say is I'm, I'm going to pick up one extra battle here. There's a burglar. He's just burgling some stuff down here in Cinnabar Mansion. And it might seem like a weird choice if you're only going to battle one battle, but there's a couple of things to keep in mind. I'm going to be very sparingly picking up extra battles from now until the end of the game for the sole purpose of setting my experience up for major battles. We are swiftly approaching the time where we're going to need battles badge boost and major fights to start to stick around to the end. So if you level up during the battle, the badge boosts are going to go away. So experience management is going to be crucial to the success of the run. It's like the top priority here. So let's just, let's keep it going because no one has ever really focused on a burglar like this for this long in the history of Pokemon videos. Blizzard is here as well. That's important too. Don't forget that. We pick it up. And after that, we get our, the first real thought provoking question of the new year. And it's something that's, it's always on our minds. We can't deny that. Is TM28 really? Really? Tombstoner, brother! And before you answer, let me stop you. It's just rhetorical. Let's just dive into Blaine. This one is about as straightforward as it gets. Surf, surf, more surfs, until you're taking a brisk swim all over Blaine's hopes and dreams. And even though we are the equivalent level here, we're still pretty weak. Let me just hammer that into your head. Squirtle's still pretty weak on its own right now. You can still lose this, like if you got crit or something. And I want you just to look at the stomp damage here from the Rapidash after I've taken like a single Leer or a Tail Whip. It's pretty high damage. If the Arcanine decides to go straight takedown or it crits, you can easily lose, but getting this one down now getting that special badge boost it was big for the run finally at level 43 with blizzard we can pick up erica this one is about as straightforward as it gets and i mentioned the pp ups earlier we're gonna use them on blizzard it makes it less risky just through the course of the game i just hit my moves here but even if i did miss it's not game over you can like tank a razor leaf if you had to but red version erica is a menace and i think water tops would be about five times worse if you couldn't skip erica for the fourth gym maybe that's a hot take but i just think victory bell's a monster now the path to the end of the game is clear and Sylph is going to be the last place I can go. I'm going to go to the 10th floor, get the candy. Not interesting. But just like the burglar in Pokemon Mansion, the scientist that you can find on the warp here is all that we need to get our experience set up right. And that's going to take us straight into rival number 5. For this fight, we need a few withdrawals, just three. I kind of went on feel here. Sometimes you do that, you know? 
and I just wanted to see what the Pidgeot was going to do, and after a couple of withdrawals, it does try to do a sand attack, but it misses, and that kind of scared me enough just to go ahead and get rid of it. It's not worth it. Gyarados is why you're going to need to set up, but when you get to that plus three badge boost to your special, Blizzard is going to be a clean two shot, and that's probably the best way to deal with it. I'm sure somebody will comment and tell me that it's not, but I don't believe you. From there, Surf and Dig, you can just take out both the Growlithe and the Alakazam, and from this point of the game on, calculating how to deal with Venusaur with out taking a Razor Leaf is top priority during routing, and that means if this blizzard connects, it's battle over, and that's just how it plays out. Perfect. After that, we do have Sabrina, and this is a bit of an awkward fight because that uh, Kadabra outspeeds you, and it means it's going to get a hit on you so it can do a lot of damage. You can see that we're a little bit higher than half health, but a one dig can take it out. Get it out of here. Let's move on. The goal for this fight is to get to Mr. Mom, and I think this is the best target to set up, and you want plus five. Plus five is what felt best to me in practice. I do get it here, but I start to take some chip damage, and before you know it, I'm getting hit here. I'm getting double slapped there. I'm in the red health, but I'm at plus five, so I should be fine, right? Now, the problem here is that I only have about a 75% chance to one-shot Venomoth and sometimes the game says that's not good enough. 75% not good enough. I barely miss the range. I get paralyzed and even though I can progress in the fight and the Alakazam kind of you know plays with me like a cat playing with a mouse, I do eventually go down for another reset. Now the solution here is just to take the guaranteed one hit and set up one additional time. I thought 75% was good enough. Apparently not. Let's see how the game wiggles its way out of 100%. Now this means that I can set up in the same spot and I go on the sweep and there's no doubt that the Venomoth is going to go down and this one is a done deal but I want you to look at this. There is a risk and this is going to be a little bit of foreshadowing for you guys. When you use Dig you go underground that means Alakazam has the chance to set up Reflect. It can survive the, the little hit here and you already know that the computer is going to fire back with a critical hit side wave. It's going to knock our shell clean off but Squirtle he does manage to survive at just 4 HP. Don't think about that too much right now. I will take this victory. Let's move on. The final gym is all that's left and just to kind of give you guys the cliff notes here I will be battling all but two of Giovanni's gym trainers the two middle trainers at the top I am gonna skip but just like the other extra battles this is for experience ranges since the badge boost is so crucial but they aren't that hard they're not interesting so let's just kind of skip ahead to the gym this one can be really straightforward. You could just go straight surf and you'd be fine. But I did spend the run kind of thinking about, you know, when can I avoid healing or when can I kind of push the PP to the max? So it's not as simple as just going straight surf. You could withdraw to boost yourself up, but I am going to level up after the Rhyhorn. And overall, I just didn't think this fight was worth manipulating experience for. The TLDR of this one is that I do take some hits here. I take a slash from Doug Trio. I miss a blizzard later down the line, and that's going to put me all the way down in red health. But I still make it through. And honestly, I think this is about as bad as this fight could ever go. And I still won, which kind of says something. So the good job, Squirtle. Hopping straight into rival number six, this is where the kind of the final bit of grinding helped out. In this final run, I didn't use any early candies, and getting to a point to where all the fights were still really manageable was really important. But as far as this fight goes, we're gonna level up directly after the Pidgeot, so just take it out and we can get prepared on the Rhyhorn. I do need the full plus six here because remember what I said earlier, the main goal is to never let Venusaur even dream about a razor leaf. Don't even think about it, buddy. Keep your leaves to yourself. I said no. And this is what you need to do to kind of achieve that. When I'm done setting up, I toss Rhyhorn to the side like the piece of trash that it is, and now it's time for old Gary. Blizzard, like always, is going to be a two-shot, but with low base HP, we've already taken some chip damage, and this little dragon rage here, it means we're, we're hurting pretty bad already, and this is why it's so important to get the experience precisely where you want it to be. Now, you're going to see the familiar scene here. I'm going to set up, and I'm just going to sweep through the team, and this one is all but over, but let me say that if you were just doing like a casual playthrough where you aren't looking at your experience it would make a pokemon like squirtle look much worse overall to play and you might think that it's easy to manipulate experience but you level up so fast in the medium slow leveling group that it's really hard not to level up at a bad time i guess the whole point here is that it's not as easy as it looks but that's down let's talk a bit before the final challenges of the run 
Now we can finally bring up that split data, and this is why I say not to focus on the mid-game stuff, because we're doing things in a different order. It's why you look at the stuff like this, the Blaine split has like a 22 minute lead, while the Erica split is 24 minutes behind. We just did it in a different order. I want you guys to focus on the first few splits and the final few splits. That's where you get your interesting data. After Giovanni, Squirtle is holding on to about a five minute lead, and when we get to that Elite Four starting point, it's gonna be at four minutes and 17 seconds ahead. But remember, withdrawal, takes a little bit longer it's a little bit slower so it will be very interesting to see how this kind of overall plays out as for what I actually do leading up to the indigo plateau I am gonna grab the rare candy I like to skip this one but I need it today I hit 52 at the end of rival 6 I've avoided using all rare candies to this point and that 11th candy will let me be at a very respectable level 63 and that's gonna be our starting point for the elite 4 you might not think much of Lorelai us resisting most of her moves you know you, you just wouldn't think much of it but I do think that's it's probably a lot worse than you think and that's why we need to front load all this candy usage now if you're a knowledgeable user you might be wondering hey why am I not saving candies to manipulate experience later because I've, I've talked a couple of times about how the badge boosts are so important but keep in mind that this is the optimized run when you're level 52 and you use 11 rare candies it is setting up our experience you might not see it now but tough fights like later like Lance and the champion they're gonna be perfect everything's gonna be set up just exactly how we want it to do so just kind of trust in the process and I think we just we should just see how it goes For my money, this is the worst fight in the Elite Four. Maybe the worst fight in the entire game. Even if things line up perfect, it's still a little bit iffy. Now for me, this is kind of like a bit of an option play. If you don't get growled, perfect. You have a much easier time in the fight. You'll be able to use neutral digs and it's gonna speed things up, but that rarely happened if, if ever in practice. Just kind of take the growls as they happen, but I actually don't see one on the dugong and we can just move on. We get our plus six. We do take about 60% damage. We're kind of limping into the cloister, but that's just fine. And there's not much you can do about it. This little clam has pretty weak special, so resisted surfs will do the job just fine. You can be annoyed here with like confusion status from like a supersonic, but it just doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. Let's move on. Now, if you manage to make it past the dugong without being ground like I did in this footage congratulations your prize is you're gonna get growled by the slow bro baby your destiny is inescapable stop trying to avoid it everything's etched into stone embrace the growl love the growl so at this point you can't use dig anymore it's too weak the growl neutered your damage but the one positive thing here on the jinx is that since we have so much setup and surf is neutral we can't just take it out in one hit we can send this demon back to where it came from and now it's just the lapras left and you might be looking at the hp and it might look a little bit questionable here but remember we're really boosted now we're doing some decent damage we have over 600 defense so despite the low health our effective health is pretty good so we're safer than you might think Lapras can be a bit of a troll with like body slam paralysis or like a confuse ray but just keep calm throw out some serves take the win and it's just it's really just gonna be downhill from here Bruno is next and if you're listening to this video only you might want to take a look because I'm done I'm not even gonna commentate over this Now we have Agatha and Dig, it goes without saying, Dig really helps here. You don't outspeed, and it would take multiple withdrawals for you to outspeed the first Gengar, so it's really just not worth it. Just take it out as fast as you can. The only real kind of nuance in this spot is a quick setup on Golbat to help with ranges here and on the snake later. And things just, they play out really well here and it's pretty clean. The one concession for Squirtle's Elite Four run was that I will level up on the final Gengar. You might think that this is a problem, but it, remember, it doesn't have hypnosis and things like Confuse Ray or Poison or Nightshade damage can be annoying and start to add up. But remember, Gengar is about as defensive as a wet piece of paper. If we can just hit one, that's all we need and that's another fight down Lance leaves with the Gyarados and this is the most problematic Pokemon in the run we've already seen it multiple times in the run the goal here is to set up plus four and that's gonna get us that two shot range and we're gonna be able to outspeed Aerodactyl but this thing has Dragon Rage and there's like the threat of a Hyper Beam crit you're gonna start to get beat up a little and you can see the Flying Serpent knock our glasses off we're hurting but we do get it down and now that it's out of the way things do get a little bit easier from there I'm gonna take a risk I don't want to get in a situation where I have to go straight Blizzard and I can miss 
because if you're at the end of the fight and you don't have anything for Dragonite, you're probably going to reset. So I go for two more setups, and that means I'm going to get hit with a Dragon Rage, and when I get to that final second setup, I do take a slam, and this little turtle is down to just 9 HP, but little does Lance know, I have him exactly where I want him. This is going to let me use Dig here rather than Blizzard to take out the middle stage dragons, and when we make it to Aerodactyl, we do outspeed since we set up earlier, and Surf can just get the job done. And the only question at the end of the fight is if you're going to hit Blizzard, and I do. That means the fight is over, and we are down to just one final battle of the run. Pidgeot is in the lead and you need 4 setups to make this fight feel pretty smooth. With only physical damage to hurt you, this one it, it's pretty safe. But if something crits like a sky attack, it can do a lot of damage and I did see that multiple times in practice. I actually get a really good fight here, I get my setups to the point I want to be at, I don't take a ton of damage and Blizzard clips this little bird's wings. The plus 4 makes Alakazam easy to deal with outside of one condition. Remember earlier? What if you dig and it uses reflect? It's going to survive the dig and then it can just one shot you with the psychic crit. You'd be in trouble then and that's exactly what happens. Just like with the Parasect race, sometimes Alakazam just shows that it doesn't care how well you played or how care, how much you prepared. It just decides it's going to win. So that's going to be a third reset here. Let's hop back in and you know the drill. Four set up, hope you don't get the crit, take out the Pidgeot. But here's an example of the computer just kind of being out of pocket, you know what I'm saying? This thing is going to get back to back wing attack crits and then it starts to charge up the sky attack and I was a little bit worried. I do get it down but we're not looking great at the moment the Pidgeot is not supposed to be the bad part of the fight at least this time Alakazam does cooperate I can take it out in a single hit and now let's focus on bringing home the win right on is where you want to finalize those last two withdrawals of the fight now sometimes you can do runs where you would want to bait out like a leer or a tail whip and get additional boost but it really doesn't matter for this fight you would need just for context you would need five additional boost on top of the six withdrawals to be able to one shot Gyarados and it's just not worth taking that much time so we take it out let's just hope for the best. Gyarados comes in and realistically this is the last obstacle in the way outside of Blizzard missing but I do hit the moves and it just goes for Leer so I'm looking in a really solid position right now. Arcanine is fire type and you already know what's going to happen here and at the end I just need Blizzard to hit. It does and that means Squirtle has finished the run. Squirtle finishes with a final time of 2 hours 44 minutes and 53 seconds with 3 resets and that means it gets a final grade of 86.28 out of 100. If you want to know more about the math there's an unlisted video in the description. Bulbasaur had a great run but better moves, better typing, that led to this little turtle getting a higher grade and that means in a solo challenge between the starters Squirtle is emphatically the best. Also keep in mind that I did about 7 playthroughs of Bulbasaur just to get that run that I got there and it only took about 4 to achieve this with Squirtle. Now I will get the tier list rolling out, but I do want to know what you guys think. I thought this run was fantastic. Did you guys think Squirtle was going to win? It just, it really has me interested in the final stages. Charizard we've already done. It has an incredible score. It's fourth on the list to, uh, right now. And I just think that's going to be incredibly hard to beat, but we'll focus on that another day. Now this is going to put Squirtle right behind Pidgeot in the B tier for the moment. And it's going to be the highest base stage Pokemon so far. It beats Slowpoke's impressive score, but do remember that I haven't redone on Gastly yet and that's going to be the undisputed king of base stage Pokemon but we'll get to all the runs in time. If you ever asked me to do a certain run, yes, eventually. Cool. Now if you made it this far in the video, you're a real one. I really do appreciate it. If you're new here, subscribe if you want more solo run content and remember to do all the engagement things that YouTube wants us to do. Like, comment, whatever. Because it just helps other people see the videos and you know, we do this out of passion and it's just cool to see it grow. The views have been down a little bit but I'm not too worried about it. It is what it is. It's happened before it's going to happen again. Special shout out to my channel members and Patreons. The support does mean a lot and it just it gives me the, the little motivation I need to keep plugging away at it. This one was delayed a little bit. I wanted to get it out in December but I was feeling a little bit drained. I was busy and I would just rather take a step back and not force myself to rush out content just for the sake of rushing out content. You guys understand. You guys are great. I'm sure you get it but we'll be back with something else next time and I think that's about all I have for you. I'll see you on the next one. Bye.